Good evening. And welcome to the fifth annual Beta Gamma Sigma induction ceremony. My name is Baman Mirshab. I'm Dean, College of Business and Information Technology. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce some of our special guests joining us this evening. Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. <laughs> Distinguished Mayor of City of Southfield, you know, Dr. Ken Sieber. Mr. Douglas Ebert, Chair of LTU Board of Trustees. <laughs> and, of course, Mrs. Ebert. <laughs> Ms. Donna Bell. <laughs> President of Ford Credit and a member of LTU's Board of Trustees. Dr. Tarak Soap, President of the University. <laughs> Dr. Verinder Madgil, my mentor and President Emeritus of the University. <laughs> On behalf of our faculty, staff, and leadership of the University, I welcome you to the college's fifth annual Beta Gamma Sigma Honor Society induction ceremony. Today's ceremony celebrates the excellent academic achievements of our students. Before we get started, let me also express my sincere appreciation to a few of our sponsors whose generosity made this event possible. You know, Dr. Armando Ash, Mr. John Beebe, Mr. John Beebe could not come here tonight. Uh, Ms. Michelle de Sosa. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. de Sosa has an event tomorrow for the governor of state of Michigan. And of course, you know, he, she has invited me to go to that house. Michelle, you know, is a distinguished member of our, I don't know what. <laughs> Mr. Scott de Zorko. Scott, are you here? No? You know. CATFAM Americas Incorporation, presented by Dr. Masoud Omrani. <laughs> Dr. Hamid Servati. And of course, you know, Young Soft uh, uh, Incorporation. Will the faculty and staff of the College of Business Information Technology please stand up to be recognized? My colleagues in the College of Business. <laughs> They are those who are running this college. Of course, I get the credit, but you know, credit belongs to them. We also welcome many members of our campus community and local industry. The list is too big, and if I read every person's name, it may take you know, a long time. But last, not least, will the parents, family members, friends, of the students, please rise to be recognized. <laughs> we are also honored that you have become part of LTU's community. Thank you for entrusting your children, stepchildren, grandchildren, siblings, friends, and relatives to us. We, the faculty and staff of Lawrence Technological University, take seriously the task of educating your loved ones. And we know that you take seriously the task of continuing to encourage and support these students as they continue their journey. Let's all take a moment to recognize our new scholars with applause. Students, 
you have been invited to become a member of Beta Gamma Sigma as you have shown an outstanding aptitude for business studies and have demonstrated your work ethic and determination. This event is a testament to your hard work. We are honored to have you join us as a new member. This recognition ceremony symbolizes your induction into a very exclusive group of top business scholars. <clears throat> Beta Gamma Sigma chapters are only permitted to establish at business institutions who have worked to obtain the prestigious AACSP accreditation. From the pool of Beta Gamma Sigma chapters, only the top 10% of undergraduate students, the top 20% of graduate students, and some of the most accomplished business practitioners are eligible to be recognized as members. Beta Gamma Sigma's origin dates back to the earliest years of 20th century. During that time, business students were largely excluded from consideration for other societies, recognizing for recognizing academic excellence. As such, three student recognition societies on the campus of University of California, Berkeley, University of Illinois, and University of Wisconsin came together in 1913 to establish a national organization which was named Beta Gamma Sigma. This name was chosen to represent the initials of three distinguished business professors at University of Wisconsin. 103 years later, Beta Gamma Sigma is the largest organization in the world honoring business student graduates internationally. Beta Gamma Sigma membership is the highest honor that a business student attending an AACSB institution can achieve. By the way, no more than 7% of business schools globally are accredited by AACSB. There are probably almost 700. 7% 7 of universities globally are accredited by AACSB. There are thousands and thousands of business schools. Members are all over the world and serve in a wide array of institutions. This allows unique opportunities for our members to network with a variety of other you know, business professionals from all walks of life. Members of the Lawrence Technological University chapter of Beta Gamma Sigma will now proceed with the recognition of newly elected members. Stephanie. Dr. Mirshav, I present these candidates for membership of Beta Gamma Sigma this year. Candidates, do you desire to be admitted to Beta Gamma Sigma? If, say, if so, say yes, I do. You have been honored by an invitation to membership in Beta Gamma Sigma because of what you have achieved in scholarship and service. We are honored to have you join us. Beta Gamma Sigma is a scholastic honor society dedicated to principles and ideals essential to worthy life as well as the commandable business career. The mission of the International Honor Society is to encourage and honor academic achievements in the study of business, to foster personal and professional excellence, and to advance the value of the society and to serve its lifelong members. The principles of Beta Gamma Sigma are presented by three Greek letters, the initials of which are our societies, Beta, Gamma, and Sigma. Here now, what beta come means to us, given by distinguished mayor of the city of Southfield, who was inducted into Beta Gamma Sigma three years ago. Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Beta is the initial letter of the Greek word uh, bibios, which signifies honor. honor 
is personal integrity and excellence of character. It is an out, uh, enduring quality found in all persons who deserve to lead others. And honor, uh, all honorable persons conscientiously seek to recognize, to uphold, and to encourage that which is ethical and that which is just. With humility, they acknowledge human failings which tend to induce the sacrifice of lofty ideas or for base gains. They are aware of the difficulty of distinguishing right from wrong when confronted by a variety of alternative goals and a multitude of pressures uh, and, means to, and the means to achieve those goals. But their honor is coupled with resolute courage. They may falter and they may fail, yet they rise with renewed determination to do what is right. Their reputations are their most priceless possessions. All honorable persons recognize their duties before they demand their rights. They respect law and promote order, not because of a negative fear of sanctions, but because affirmative conviction that a good society requires stability, which order provides. Worthy members of Beta, Gamma, Sigma conscientiously seek to act honorably at all times. Thus, they confidently pursue peace of mind, happiness for themselves, even as they serve as an exemplar for others. Honor is a guiding star which encourages altruism, enlightened social responsibility, and service rather than selfishness. I ask you, to accept honor as an ideal to be translated into reality in your conduct every day of your life. Thank you, Mr. Listen now to the explanation of Gamma by Mr. Sanad Avra. Thank you, Dean Mirshab, distinguished guests. Gamma is the initial letter of the Greek word gnosis, which means wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge tested by experience and tempered by discerning judgment. It arbors prejudice and insists upon freedom of thought and expression. Truly wise persons are aware of their talents and achievements and do not deny or belittle them with misplaced modesty. However, they are also acutely aware of their own limitations and are sympathetic to the shortcomings of others. They are quick to acknowledge their profound dependence on masters who have gone before them. They laud those who have laboriously built earlier civilizations and they gratefully accept the rich intellectual and cultural heritage they have provided. They are moreover thankful for the contributions to their development made by family and friends, by superiors and subordinates, by associates and antagonists. Persons of wisdom constantly seek a better comprehension for more fruitful application of what is known. They are also endlessly engaged in a, in a quest for understanding of what is unknown. Although the fund, although the fund of human knowledge has literally multiplied, in recent decades, the wise person happily anticipates a future which promotes to provide a geometric expansion of this treasure store. Confronted by a variable flood of facts and concepts, the person of wisdom exercises special discrimination to select, to arrange, to relate, to interpret, and apply. This is a challenge worthy of the finest mind. I ask you to continue your quest for wisdom. Nurture it and utilize it in, in your conduct every day of your life. Thank you. Listen, finally, to the explanation of Sigma given by Ms. Lydia Michael, president of Beta Gamma Sigma chapter in Michigan. Dr. Mershop. Good evening, everyone.
sigma is the initial letter of the Greek word spude, which means earnestness. Earnestness is enthusiasm measured by achievement, disciplined by reason, and ennobled by sincerity. It is that dynamic quality which is essential for all great achievement. Earnest persons reject both temerity and timidity. They have courage to match their convictions. They inspire confidence, confidence, invite action, and generate progress. Without earnestness, both honor and wisdom lose much of their potential effectiveness. Noble purposes, defined with wisdom and upheld with honor, remain evanescent dreams without the driving power of sensible enthusiasm. The greatest personal achievements are tributes to the blending of honor, wisdom, and earnestness in the minds and hearts of those who lead. Rewards for the individual and progress for society surely proceed from this wholesome union of qualities. To each of you, much has been given in mind and body and spirit. Of each of you, accordingly, much is expected. Earnestness will help provide the perseverance that dispels weariness, the forward thrust that overcomes opposition, and the resilience that rebounds from reverses. To the earnest person, problems become opportunities for service and for profit. I ask you to accept earnestness as a guide and stimulant in your personal conduct every day of your life. Thank you. You have heard the principles that members of Beta Gamma Sigma endorse and strive to uphold honor, wisdom, and earnestness. Do you accept these principles as your own? If so, say, I do. Please repeat after me statement in which you formally accept the principles of Beta, Gamma, Sigma. The words are also listed in your program. I pledge myself to maintain and uphold, I pledge myself to maintain and uphold. the ideals and principles of Beta Gamma Sigma, the Scholastic Business Honor Society, and use it for the betterment of humankind. I will cultivate earnestness in all my understandings. I will cultivate earnestness in all my understandings. As a member of this chapter of Beta Gamma Sigma, as a member of this chapter of Beta Gamma Sigma, I recognize my obligation to assist and cooperate. I recognize my obligation to assist and cooperate in the development of its purposes. In the development I will seek by all honorable means to advance the interest of the college and university, of my community and of my nation. Do you affirm this pledge? If so, say I do. In recognition of your accomplishments and of your pledge to high ideals, we will now present to you the key of Beta Gamma Sigma. This key is a symbol of the ideals of honor, wisdom, and earnestness, which you have accepted. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Tarek Soap to join us and we proceed with your know, presentation of your know, certificate. Ms. Stephanie Jones, Lord belongs to you. I'd also like our readers to come up to help present the awards, Lydia and Senate and uh, Mayor Siever. Dr. Mr. President. Yes. 
So at this time, I will call each person by name. You will um, stop at the table with Mina and Claire. You'll receive your certificate, your pin, which is your key to Beta Gamma Sigma, your cord, and then you'll head over here to take a photo with our distinguished guest. And if the honorable members would stay um, up on the stage to help present the rest of the awards, that would be great. Thank you. So we will start with the Honorable Brenda L. Lawrence. And next is Dr. Douglas E. Ebert. Next, we'll start with our students. You will pause for a photo over here after you receive your cords, and then you can go sit down at your table. Joshua Aker. Krishna Berry. Lyndon Kamaj. Connor Davis. Brett Dulecki.
Jason, Jason Earhart. Earhart. Yusuf Haddad. Helen Harding. Madeline, Madeline Hudson. Hudson. Benkut Imadi. Christina Montemayor. Yvonne Mutan. Grant Mueller. Marcos, Marcos David, David Palacio Tortolero. Michael Perdicaro. Andrea, 
Anjani, Anjani Punamaraju. Shelby Rash. Rash. Matthew Ripper. Noah Rodriguez. Marwa Saad. Basma Samkari. Shrutika Shrutav. Nicole Waldenmeyer. Waldenmeyer. And last but not least, Wassal Youssef.
At this time, I'm going to ask President of Lawrence Technological University, Dr. Tarek Soap, to come to the podium and you know introduce you know Mr. Doc Ebers, who is going to uh, give his uh, remarks before dinner. Dr. Soap. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean Mershap. Douglas, Douglas Ebert, Ebert has served on Lawrence Technological University's Board of Trustees since 2006 and as chairman of the board since 2014. He also chaired the board's finance committee from 2006 till 2014 and in 2012 led the university's presidential search that resulted in the selection of Dr. Verinder Mudgil as LTU's seventh president and CEO. Mr. Ebert has had extensive experience in leading, directing, and managing organizations and continues to serve on Cranbrook's investment committee and also operates in competitive environments during times of change. He previously spent 33 years in the financial services industry. Between 1993 till 2001, Mr. Ebert held a number of positions with the former Michigan National Corporation and the Michigan National Bank, including Vice Chair of the Board, President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chief Operating Officer. Earlier, he was Senior Executive Vice President of the Manufacturers Hanover Trust Company based in New York City and held other leadership roles with banks and banking organizations in Florida and Indiana. Mr. Ebert has been a trustee of Beaumont Health Systems since 2010 and chairs its investment committee. He has served on many other community boards, including the American Heart Association Heart Walk, Citizens Research Council of Michigan, Detroit Economic Club, Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the Skillman Foundation. He continues to serve the Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation and is trustee of its finance committee. He is also a trustee and member of the executive committee of Trinity Polling School in New York, where he is active in several other committees of the board. He is a graduate of Williams College in Massachusetts. Mr. Ebert has devoted a significant part of his life to improving education. The reason, he says, is that the global competitiveness of the U.S. is at risk if our educational system, from pre-K to the graduate level, fails our students. I had the benefit of great teachers and administrators at both the secondary and primary levels during my educational years, and I hope to be able to help ensure that LTU continues in its leadership capacity. On a personal note, uh, I would like to express my thanks and gratitude for Doug's help and uh, his support during my transition from Dr. Mudgill's presidency to my own. Now, I invite Mr. Ebert to give some remarks to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very honored to have received this recognition. I sincerely thank you, Dean and the College of, Business, uh, College of Business and Information Technology for making this happen. This is one of the most meaningful recognitions I've received in a long time, with the possible, not with possible, but with the exception when my three and a half year old grandson looks up and says, I love you, Grandpa. That, 
obviously takes the cake. I applaud this year's inductees. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful achievement that all of you have uh, been recognized for, and I know this will continue. I assure you that the, the education that you're receiving here at LTU, thanks to your terrific, dedicated, passionate faculty, will prepare you extraordinarily well for whatever road you choose to follow as you go on through post-graduation from Lawrence Tech. I'd like to share some thoughts with you based on my nearly 60 years in, in the business community in one form or another that I hope might help you be, think a bit about your future and what might be important to you as you go forward. I'll keep this brief because I know I'm the last thing between you and dinner. Uh, and my comments are shorter than the introduction that Dr. Soap just provided. <laughs> You're very welcome. I believe one of the keys to success in a career, and I don't care where it is, what it is, whether it's a career you start with and change to something else or something that you stay with, one of the keys, I believe, to success is passion. You have to really care about what you are doing. You have to love it. Um, I spent a lot of time traveling internationally uh, for one of my earlier institutions. Probably half my life was uh, spent overseas. And I love that part of it. It's in 155 countries um, during that period of time. But what kept me going was the joy of what I was doing, the, the, the sense that I had that I was creating something of value and adding something to the world in which I was, was working. There's an old saying that if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. And I think that is absolutely true. I also encourage you, besides having passion for what you do, to make sure that you commit to be involved in whatever it is. That's critically important for your own growth. It's critically important for the entity or entities with which you work. But it's also critically important to create and have the friends and teamwork uh, that you've got to get along with, got to be related to uh, in, in your positions, regardless of what that position is. Very few jobs can be done in isolation, and even fewer friendships can ever be created and maintained in isolation. So you really need to make sure that you're reaching out to those that are around you and to be part of and work with them as well as support them. My next point is balance. Now, this might seem contradictory to what I was just saying about passion and involvement and commitment, but you also need to have a balance in your life. Your, your careers, your positions should not be all-consuming. You need to work with family and friends and bring them into what you're doing um, so that you can share with them your successes and your failures, and there will be failures. Because it's those people, your family and your friends, that you bring into the balance that will help you work through your successes and your failures, and they will not judge you. Uh, because they are your friends, they are your family. Rather than judge you, they will be supportive and they will encourage you. Keep learning. Theory and practice is our model here. Once you get out of here, you, the theory becomes practice, but you have to continue to learn in that, that world. The world keeps changing on all of us. And if you continue to see the world around you the way everybody else does, without recognizing what is changing, you're gonna be stuck. So you had to keep learning, you had to keep your eyes open, your minds open, and figure out how can you change your world perception at the same time as you also help people around you change their views of the world. And that's what will make you great leaders in that process. And finally, integrity. Nothing survives if you are not of the highest integrity, the highest principles in whatever you do, wherever you go, and whoever you are with. That is who you are, that is what your character will be. So always maintain your integrity. In spite of anything, any roadblocks or any challenges you may run into, maintain that personal integrity. I'd like to finish with a very short quote from Winston Churchill. And he said, success is not final Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue 
that really counts. Thank so you thank you very much. Are you having fun? Okay. <laughs> While you are eating, we are going to continue with our program. But, uh, but before you know, we proceed to the next step. I would like to read for you the tale of two presidents, because we have, of course, President Tarek's two presidents. Tale of two presidents. Right, right. <laughs> A retiring president left two envelopes for his successor and advised him to open each letter when he faces a crisis. Soon, he had his first crisis, open the envelope. It read, blame it on your predecessor. <laughs> the second crisis emerged and he opened the second envelope. It read, prepare two letters for your successor. <laughs> but, you know, before we proceed, you know, uh, we have two, uh, you know, uh, special, you know, birthday events. One is for my wife, Maria, just turned 22 a couple of days ago. And then, you know, uh, also Dr. Servati. So today, you know, I went, you know, I bought that cake from Shakila. And what I'm gonna do is to just, you know, say happy birthday to Mariam and Dr. Servati. I didn't buy enough for everybody, oh. but you know, you know where you can go to buy that. <laughs> so, you know, what we can do is that Richard says, you know, we should read happy birthday, sing happy birthday, okay. So Mariam, where are you? Okay, happy birthday to you, go ahead. All right, let's sing a chorus of happy birthday to yes. our special birthday guests. Yeah. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. By the way, the cake, you know, I purchased from Shakila in um, uh, Dearborn. So if you really want, you know, really good cake, go there. At any rate. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to ask uh, our president, President Tarek Soap, to step to the podium and introduce our keynote speaker, Honorable Ms. Brenda Lawrence. Thank you, Dean Mershaw. Congress Brenda Lawrence represents Michigan's 14th Congressional District, which includes a portion of Detroit, the city of Southfield, and 16 other cities located in Oakland and Wayne counties. Living in the 14th District her entire life, she was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in November of 2014 and has been re-elected in 2016 and 2018. Congresswoman Lawrence serves as co-chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus and second vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. She's a vice chair of the powerful House Appropriations Committee and serves on the Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Human Services, and Education. Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and the Subcommittee on Financial Services and General Government. She is also a member of the House Committee on Government Oversight and Reform, where she serves on the Subcommittee on Government Operations. Born and raised in Detroit, Congresswoman Lawrence is a product of Michigan's public school system. She's an alumna of Pershing High School and earned her bachelor's degree in public administration from the Central Michigan University. Before she began her career in public service, the Congresswoman had a notable career with the U.S. Postal Service. 
In November of 2001, Congresswoman, the Congresswoman was elected as mayor of the city of Southfield. She was the first African American and the first woman to serve in that position. She previously held on the South City's Southfield City Council, where she was elected president in 1999. Additionally, she sat on the Southfield Public School Board of Ed, where she served as president, vice president, and secretary. Congresswoman Lawrence and her husband, MacArthur Lawrence, are the proud parents of Michael and Michelle. They also adore one granddaughter, Asia. Uh, Congresswoman Lawrence knows very well that our university is named after her, and, uh, and I came to understand and know that like the second day that I arrived uh, <laughs> at Lawrence Tech, and it's really my honor and pleasure to introduce Lawrence Tech's, one of Lawrence Tech's best friends and my own personal best friends. Congresswoman Lawrence, please. I want to say good evening to everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, again, I'm Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, and I represent proudly the Michigan 14th District. I want to say thank you to um, the president of my university and my past president of my university. Uh, thank you for keeping the integrity of this amazing institution worthy of its name. You have done such an amazing job in educating the next generation of innovators, engineers, critical thinkers, game changers. Every year you open your doors to amazing minds and curious thinkers. And I'm so proud to have served this community in multi-levels of responsibility in every step along the way from K through 12 school board, knowing that Lawrence Tech was sitting there ready to open their doors to our students, to serve in the city council where we partnered in the development and growth of the amazing campus of LTU. And now as a member of Congress where I have an opportunity to direct federal dollars and programs to partner with this amazing place of learning to embrace you. And tonight, I want to say thank you and proud and congratulations to my colleagues, over 625 inductees, to tonight be placed in the amazing Beta Gamma Sigma organization. That's, that is one that recognizes your abilities and your skills. I just want to say a few things to you today. I want to quote one of the founders of the organization, which I'm now proudly a member of. Success is not measured by income, although often the question when people meet you will be, well, how much do you make? It's not measured by income, but by influence. Because it's the person who can make change, positive change. You can have all kind of money and income, but every single day of your life, you're creating a legacy. And if I could quote my grandmother who told me, if you wake up every morning, and she used to use this simple term, and you wake up in your right mind, and as you get older, you understand the value of that. <laughs> and you're breathing, and you can think, and you can speak. There's work for you to do. So some people chase a dream. And in America, we're so great that if you chase a dream and apply all your skills and talents, guess what? You will be rewarded for that. So the, your objective, I will say humbly, is where can you walk where others haven't? Where can you influence or use your voice where others have been silent? That's what power is, especially in these United States of America. And success is not measured by power, but by personality. 
You know, you look at some people and say, how in the world did they get there? <laughs> you know, I probably have a 4.56789, and they only had a 3.1. But they're really excelling. It's people want to be heard, they want to be respected, and they want to be included. And when you learn that, you build a team, you embrace others, and you form this team that will do amazing things because you empower them. When I lecture or talk to people about where you are, are you a leader, and how you become a leader, some people think they're so amazing, they just step out there and say, I'm in charge, I'm a leader, and, and, you know, and I make the decisions. But when you look behind them, no one's following them. That's not a leader. And so success is defined by, it's not measured by income, but by influence, not by power, but by personality, and not by capital, but by character. Tonight, when we were talking about inducting and taking the pledge to be a part of this organization, we talked about character. Now, you've heard the, the term, what you do speaks so loud I can't hear a word that you're saying. If your life every day, whether you plan it or not, especially as you grow in your career and in, in life and, and start making your own mark, it's not so much your testimony or you standing up at a mic, or it's what you do. It's your character. When no one's watching, what do you do? Some people are great on camera, but when you turn the camera off, the real person shows up. But understand, someone's always watching. And someone that, sometimes that person watching is the one that holds the key to your future. So character, you are who you are. And I'm not telling you who you should be, but your character means something. I, um, I often think about, in politics, politicians are great orators, you know? We can get to the mic and we can speak and do all those things. But the greatest compliment that I got when I announced that I wasn't running for re-election, I can't say senior anymore, because obviously I'm a senior, but a lady older than me, called me up and she said, I'm so proud of you. I really hate that you're leaving, but you know what I'm most proud of? You never embarrassed us. And you showed up when we needed you. You took our calls. And when you were in Washington, D.C., and I listened to you, you were talking about what we needed. She said, you never embarrassed us. That meant so much to me because at the end of the day, I'm a public servant, and that's what I want my legacy to be. Those of you who are so young, it's so hard for you to think about legacy, but every single one of us, whether our career is picking up garbage or designing the next flying car, which I'm counting on you all to do. I say this every time I speak. I want a flying car because I don't like traffic jams. I want to be able to you know, elevate, go over, put my down. Regardless of where you are in your walk of life, it is so important that you understand that everybody on this earth gets two dates, a begin date and an end date, and we all get a dash in between. What do you do with that dash defines who you are as a person? Your legacy is about trying I didn't say it's about winning, because everybody who wins and you give them accolades and awards, along that dash, they have failures. But the ones who end up winning is because I used to, you know, I learned along the way and I started giving this to other people. My first management job I received, I had a, I had a, I don't like to use boss because we're not in that, I'm, my manager, was very hard-nosed, and he was, 
whipping, you know? I had a tough time with him. And a mentor of mine said, Brenda, every time you have a conflict, say thank you. Walk up to him and say thank you. You gave me a rose today. Because every critique that he gives you, every fault that he finds in you, gives you an opportunity to get better and to grow and to be able to check that box. And so I took it as a challenge when I came in. I said, what do you got today? What are you going to criticize me for today? And it, it became a mental game with me to perform in a way that I would have excellence not only for myself, but for those who were with me. And I tell you, I had a bouquet by the time I left and was promoted over him. Um, but it was, I, I learned that criticism and those things that we call failures are really a rose in life. And those of us who win, we end up with a bouquet that we can sit back and say, because of this, I'm better. Because of this, I grew and I learned. And I say to every young person, please know that the challenges that surround me will not define my destiny. Because my destiny is so much bigger than these challenges that present themselves to me today. And you shake it off. And you grow and you learn and you understand that this life that we're so blessed to have is filled with ups and downs. And I share with people one time, I ran for an office. And you know, when you're in politics, your whole life is on the evening news and it's kind of public. And I lost the race and I was devastated. My granddaughter came in and I didn't want to get out of bed. I you know, had to cover over my head, I was just crushed. And she said, Grandma, get up. I said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I hope I didn't embarrass you. All your friends knew I was running for this office. I lost, I'm a loser. She said, Grandma, get up. She said, Grandma, you're still my grandmother. And at that time, I was still the mayor. She said, get up. People love you, they voted for you. Maybe you didn't win, but get up. And I, when I feel like I have the greatest challenge, I can hear that little voice telling me to get up. And I'm saying this because I need every last one of you. I need you to be brilliant. I need you to address the concerns and issues that I am intimately aware of in this country. And I can go down a whole list. I can list our issue right now with a possible war in Ukraine, the balance of that. I get classified briefings that I get information that you may not hear. The immigration issue is broken and now we're saying we're gonna take in 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. How in the world are we gonna do that? And what about the people who are already on the waiting list? The environment. We are required to travel in Congress around the world and look at issues and how we can partner to save this place we call home, which is the entire globe. I was speaking to someone tonight. She was saying her daughter was going to Paris for spring break. And I said, the greatest responsibility that I feel we have as parents is to teach our children that they are global citizens. You're not just the resident of Southfield. You're not just the resident of England or Maine or whatever. You are a global citizen. And our responsibilities and accountability is great and is broad. And I, I want you to know that I need you more than ever. I need you to care about Prescription drugs, we just passed a bill to lower the rate of insta, in, um, insulin in the United States. Criminal justice reform, I could talk to you about that. We have to have a trust in our law enforcement that when we call 911, that they're coming to rescue us, protect us, and serve us. 
and not have a fear that I'm calling the person that's going to take my life. We need to talk about gun violence in America. How many babies in our schools do we have to bury before we understand that we have a health crisis in America with gun violence? We have so many issues. But as I look at the issues, I want to tell you that this America that we call home has the greatest democracy in the world. And I often tell people I love America, even though she didn't love me back. I, she didn't love me because I was a woman. I, what, I didn't have the right to vote. I couldn't own property in my own name. I couldn't, at some point, I couldn't even get an education. But our democracy, this thing that we call a democracy in this United States, allowed the voice of the people to say, we're going to change that. We're going to seek equality. She didn't love me because I was African American and denied me rights and freedoms. And people marched, died, and, and protest till we got a democracy that lifted and opened the doors. And when we look around the room at this amazing diversity that we have in the United States of America, it makes me so happy. It sends me the energy I need to fight and protect this democracy. And I'm just going to close with this. The fact that we can educate our children in America, whether we have an income of $30,000 a year or homeless, the right for our children to be educated, and then to have an institution like Lawrence Tech that not only educate but take brilliant minds and just nurture and massage them and create this level of knowledge for me, it's creative. It's taking me beyond where I am today. So I count on you. I'm always glad when I see the women standing with the men. I'm excited when I see the diversity of cultures and religions coming together on a common umbrella of education and remember the value of those who did not walk your same path. Respect that because as this world continues and this America continues to evolve, diversity and respect of it is the only way we will survive. I want you to know that I fight and I believe in one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I believe in that. I fight for it every day when I go to Congress. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And when I get the keys to my flying car, <laughs> I'll write an article in the paper thanking all of you, because I may not know where you are, to say thank you for that. God bless you, and thank you. Excellent speech, magnificent. Uh, uh, we are fast approaching the end of the ceremony, but uh, first, you know, I'm going to ask, you know, Lydia, come before, you know, our president gives, you know, uh, the closing remarks as president of, you know, uh, Beta Gamma Sigma Michigan, you know, come and, you know, just, you know, briefly mention what you want to do, and then, you know, President Tarak Sob will come, you know, to give us, you know, the closing remarks. Thank you, Dean Mershop. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. I won't keep you too long, but I just wanted to share a few words with you here today. Again, my name is Lydia Michael. I'm the president of the Beta Gamma Sigma Alumni Detroit Chapter, 
we actually are the first chapter in the state of Michigan in the history of Beta Gamma Sigma since, two, since 1913. Really excited about this as we grow the chapter, and of course a big part of it is connecting with the uni universities across the state, one of them Lawrence Tech University, so thank you for your dedication and your support really since the first day that we've connected. I want to share a little bit more with uh, the students as well as far as the background goes of creating this chapter and really talking a little bit more about your involvement. And so. Going back uh, many, many years ago, I won't date myself, but I was a student at Wayne State University, and one day I received a letter in the mail inviting me to join Beta Gamma Sigma. Not really knowing what Beta Gamma Sigma was about, I saw that it was about, I think, 50 or $60 at the time to join. I didn't know what that entailed, but I read that I was going to be a lifetime member. And so I thought that that would be a great opportunity to just join and become a member and be able to put that on my resume. So I did, and I was an inactive member for many, many years. Uh, there was no engagement at the time, there really wasn't much involvement with Beta Gamma Sigma, and so all it was at the time for me was just a title on my resume. And so years later when I decided after working and deciding to go back to Germany, which is where I was born and raised, to do an international MBA program, I received another letter in the mail towards the end of my program. And that letter, again, invited me to join Beta Gamma Sigma. And I thought, that sounds familiar. So, exactly. Well, 10 more dollars, because I was then in grad school. And so to join a second time, and not knowing that you could join a second time in grad school, uh, I paid another $10 and decided to just join the ship again. But that time, it was different. It was different because here I was in a completely different country, in a different continent, and I realized how powerful Beta Gamma Sigma has to be. The fact that I was able to join the same organization in the United States and several years later in Germany had to mean something. And so I started doing a little bit more research. I started to get engaged with the chapter in Germany. And upon the return to the US, I wanted to become a little bit more involved. And so I reached out to the Beta Gamma Sigma headquarters and I inquired about a group or a chapter that existed here in Michigan, wanting to, again, get involved in the community, looking for a job, all of those great things. And I was told that at the time, there really wasn't a chapter available, but that if I was interested, I could start one. And so I said, okay, that's a great, great way to start looking for a job, which later turned into me really building my own business, which is a multicultural marketing and brand consultancy today. But at the time, I thought that's a great opportunity to just connect again in the community, meet some new people, networking. And so I started a networking group in 2018. And a year later, we were able to form an official chapter. And so the president of Beta Gamma Sigma at the time came out to Michigan, and we became an official chapter in 2019. So a few years later, here we are, um, Noir Georges, Sunet also, who are both university liaisons, really helping us grow the chapter. We have a few more people of our leadership team who are not here today, but who send their hello. And we're really working hard to make this a success because networking matters. And as Brenda Lawrence said, being a global citizen matters. And we really want to connect with the students here today and let you know that there is more to Beta Gamma Sigma than just the letter in the mail that I had received back in the day. There really is value to this. Again, I was able to connect with the chapter in Germany. We have since then uh, hosted events every single quarter since we've become an active chapter. And so we host events around education. We bring in different guest speakers around topics. But we also have times where we just want to meet each other and learn more about what we do and sort of just connect with each other, right? And so those are the times that are really valuable that are allowing us to grow our network to be able to give back to each other and really make this not just a local or regional chapter, but really something that is global and that doesn't have any limits. And so to all of the students who are here today, I ask you to do one thing before you leave. If you can take out your phones and send an email to our chapter, it's bgsdetroitalumni at gmail.com. And just send us a quick note that you've joined as a new member 
and we will make sure to add you to our local list and keep you update on, updated on all of the events and happenings that are taking place. And the reason being is our goal is to really create a gap, or to bridge the gap, sorry, to bridge the gap between the student chapters and our alumni chapters. We want to make sure that you are now becoming engaged and really understanding the value so that by the time you graduate, you already know what Beta Gamma Sigma is about. You continue to engage with our alumni chapter and continue to grow with that chapter and know that there is a home outside and after the student chapter that you're now a part of. So again, that's bgsdetroitalumni at gmail.com. Feel free to email us, connect with us, and we hope to see you at one of our events. Thank you so much. By the way, I was inducted into Beta Gamma Sigma in 1979. A week later, I got a letter that we have made a mistake. I said, too late. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tarasov, you know, could you please step to the podium and, you know, give the closing remarks. Just a very quick remark. The Congresswoman mentioned the flying cars, right? I mean, that's the hope and the aspiration for the future. There is a company called Terra Fuga in Massachusetts that actually has produced a flying car. And believe it or not, two of our mechanical engineering students have gotten job offers there last year. So uh, it's kind of really fascinating, really fascinating. Uh, it is actually the only flying car uh, manufacturer in the US. Uh, there is another two, two of them are in Slovenia and one other country in Europe, but in the US that's the first one. Um, as my predecessor always used to say, Dr. Mudgal, you put a professor in front of a microphone and you need the fire marshals to take her, her or her down. <laughs> and I know that I'm the only one standing between you and going home and relaxing for the night. But I can't resist myself, but well, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'll just tell you a very quick story. And uh, the story is, is really about how I ended up being here and I'll try to do it very fast. Uh, near, near the end of my tenure with my previous employer, uh, and I worked with that employer in Connecticut, Richport, for 25 years. Uh, I, I, I was interested in moving to a technological university, uh, a university that truly focuses on technology, but comprehensive, meaning a university that offers all the, ma the majors, but ensures that every student and every major comes out very technologically trained, very savvy in technology. And I also was looking forward to literally a, pres a position out of two position, either a provost position or a president position, because these are very good leadership positions of higher academia. This country is home to 6,000 universities. And uh, when I started, you know, my really job search process, uh, I thought that there would be maybe three, 400 universities that are very technologically focused and comprehensive amongst these 6,000. And uh, I, I was actually stunned. <laughs> uh, it turned out there were only 56 such universities in the whole country that by mission, vision, and name are technological universities. And only half of these, meaning half a percent or less, 28 universities, were truly comprehensive all the way from associate's degree all the way to PhD degrees and have all the majors. I wasn't also very well built for working in public universities, so I wanted to, to actually work in a private university. And that narrowed the list further to 13 universities. So I was looking really at 26 positions, right? Because in every university, there is a provost and a president. And of course, I gave up, right? Because usually presidents and provosts stay a very long time, and there was no openings. And and then karma happened and, you know, the university was looking for a provost and the recruiter called and I was blessed to come here, uh, you know, as a provost. The point is, this is an incredibly elite institution. Lawrence Tech is one of less than a quarter percent of universities in the whole country that are technological, comprehensive and private. We are in the company of great universities like Lawrence Tech, including the MIT, Caltech, RPI, WPI, and six others, and that's it, even more. This is one of very few universities, even within this exclusive club, that is so intimately close to industry. 
with amazing internships and co-ops and wonderful opportunities for our students to have experiential education before they graduate. Highest income per graduate in all of the Metro Detroit region area and also probably one or two in the whole state in terms of graduating salaries. Um, we're all, I am personally very blessed to be here. Uh, I felt home from day one. Uh, our students are absolutely the best, 100%. And these students here in this room are the best of the best. Please give them a hand. <laughs> Our students, Congresswoman, will be working on flying cars and nanotechnologies and autonomous cars and uh, uh, 3D printing of houses and analytics and business intelligence and incredible jobs of the future. And they'll be working on careers and job titles that don't even exist yet. That's what we do here. And again, congratulations to all our students. Congratulations to our other inductees, Mr. Ebert and Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. And thank you all. Have a wonderful night and have a safe drive home. Thank you. <laughs>